Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Amanda Lake, and I um, am head of carbon and circular economy with Jacobs and based here in Edinburgh in Scotland. And it's a real pleasure to be hosting this webinar. Um, and I'd like to welcome um, Anna Katrine and, and Jakob from Envidan. And together we've been planning um, this series. And, um, and it's really about um, global lessons that we can all uh, learn from the monitoring and mitigation work for process emissions um, that we're seeing happening in the water sector. And in particular, the focus here is Denmark because there's been some really exciting progress in Denmark and um, that's what we want to talk about today. So this webinar is, is on methane. Um, we've got a webinar um, in September, uh, which uh, Anna Katrina and Jakob will be hosting on nitrous oxide. And um, we, yeah, we're really looking forward to getting started with a fantastic panel. So I'll not take too much time um, just to, to welcome everyone and in particular to thank um, Charles and Brenda and William and the team at Iowa for, um, for hosting this. This webinar series is really a follow-on from the Climate Smart Utilities workshop um, that, we, that, we, that was organised in Copenhagen last year at, the, at World Water Congress and um, really an opportunity to share the, the knowledge um, more broadly across the sector, which is really important as we all um, consider our responsibility to take climate action. Um, so we've got, we'll record the webinar, it will be made available along with the materials. Um, please raise questions in the Q&A, um, not the chat box. And we will have a, um, a, a, a short section for questions after each presentation, um, but we will also have a little time at the end. Um, and we've got an extra 10 minutes or so if we need beyond the 90 minute webinar. Um, just to wrap up if it's a particularly exciting conversation. So we've got a really fantastic lineup of, um, of really the, the, certainly the Danish leaders, but I would also say global leaders in methane monitoring and mitigation work. And um, with that, I'd really just like to hand across to, um, to Charlotta to kick us off with an introduction. Um, here we're really learning about the, the national monitoring programs that, have, um, that we've seen progress in Denmark and um, to share this knowledge and, and then reflect on it um, together. So with that, I'd like to hand across to Charlotte to introduce herself. And um, again, thank you so much um, all for joining and in particular to the fantastic guests we've got today. Thanks, Charlotte. Thank you for the introduction and um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, my name is Charlotte Scholz and I'm a professor at the Technical University of Denmark. I have a background in waste management and resource recovery. And especially the last 15 years, I've focused quite a lot on measuring um, emissions, that's methane emissions and also nitrous oxide emissions from many different activities in our societies and also include uh, biogas. So with this, I'll just start with giving a little bit of introduction or background to the project. And I'll try to change the slide. It's a little bit of delay on it, I see. Yeah. So, um, so a little bit of, of background. So Denmark has invested in the expansion of biogas production in order to phase out fossil fuels. The expansion um, has primarily been uh, within manure-based biogas plants that deliver then upgraded biogas. We call this biomethane to the national uh, natural gas grid. And as you can see in this figure today, the share of biomethane in the Danish gas system is, is relatively high, so close to soon approaching 40%. Um, but back in, in 2016, some preliminary investigations uh, had shown that there could be leaks um, at biogas plants, and then, of course, methane is then lost to the atmosphere. And since biogas in Denmark has been heavily uh, subsidized, the Danish Energy Agency found that it was necessary to investigate whether the Danish biogas plants actually uh, were leaking and losing uh, some methane to the atmosphere. Um, so this, uh, so why is this important? This is what is shown at this figure. So this figure shows methane loss and climate change impact. And what you see is that um, yeah, this figure should then show why it is important. So if you look at the figure shows the climate change impact in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions or CO2 equivalent. And in this case, it's illustrated by calculating 
the carbon footprint for manure-based biogas plants for a manure-based uh, biogas plant. And the positive numbers um, are emissions to the atmosphere, and then they represent a burden to the environment. And the negative numbers uh, on the scale here, they represent a saving or a benefit uh, to the environment. And the main savings are fossil fuel substitution, so that's the base bar here, uh, and then uh, also reduced emissions due to a change in the manure management. Uh, so you have lower emissions from storage of digested uh, manure compared to raw manure. Um, but if we then look at the emissions to the environment, these consist of emissions from the use of electricity and heat. And then most important, especially uh, for today's session, is the methane loss. And here you can see uh, different calculations uh, assuming different methane losses. And the methane loss here is the methane lost out of the total methane production. So when we go from 1% to 2% to 5%, 10% and 20% loss, you can see that you very quickly uh, lose the environmental benefit in terms of climate impact when these losses approach 5, 10, and even 20%, there is actually no net benefit. And when we, some of the early studies that we did back in 2016, they actually showed methane losses of two to 5% and occasionally also 10%. And that was, a, of course, a little bit, um, yeah, concerning uh, what is then the overall uh, benefit of investing heavily in, in biogas. So that's a little bit of a background for the project. So what was this project about? So I'm trying to change the slide. Here it is. So um, the Danish uh, Energy Agency, they initiated a study which should support both the biogas plant operators and also the industry in general, as well as the government. And concerning the biogas plant, they should get some assist assistance in finding their uh, methane leaks and also have their emissions quantified, and then also get a good overview of uh, what are the possibilities of reducing uh, or minimizing leaks and methane loss using best available technology. Um, for the industry and the government, the project should improve the knowledge in the field and also support that emissions were reduced, and also that the national emission factors that are used in the inventory reporting uh, should be updated and hopefully also reduced so in the project, there were two overall tasks, you could say. So the first task was to build and disseminate knowledge to reduce methane losses, uh, whereas the second task focused a lot on measurements. So in the first task, we developed self-control programs for the participating biogas facilities and also um, uh, made uh, best available technology available. We did also... Um, yeah, different kind of guidance materials and, and so on. And then the second task, as I just mentioned, was focused very much on, on measuring emissions. So we looked both into um, developing best practice regarding measurements of methane emissions and also leak search on biogas plants. And then it was actually to carry out leak searches and quantify emissions at the participating uh, biogas plants. So in Denmark, we have around 140, 44, I think, existing uh, biogas producing plants. Um, and in total, we had 60 plants uh, signing up and participating in, in this uh, project. And 35 were agricultural plants, so that means that they primarily run on manure. And then we had 25 wastewater treatment plants participating. And then we also had another nine plants that uh, were included. They had been part of a volunteering um, monitoring program. That was something that the Biogas Association had initiated years uh, er earlier. Um, and we got the chance to include the emissions that these nine plants had uh, measured early on. So I would say all in all, we quantified emissions at a bit more than 50% of the total Danish biogas productions. 
a variety of plants were included, both in terms of the type, as I already said, agricultural plants, centralized and decentralized agricultural plants, and also wastewater treatment plants. They were very different in terms of size, so how much do they produce, but also in the gas utilization, do they have combined heat and power, or do they upgrade, uh, um, do they upgrade their biogas to biomethane? Is it used on-site or off-site? And we also saw a difference in terms of the construction year or the um, age of the plant. So um, one of the important things that were done was a methane uh, leak search. So they were carried out with a methane sensitive camera and processes at the, each individual plant. They were then searched with this camera uh, on the basis of a plan review where we have identified all the different uh, unit processes and the potential uh, processes where you often find leaks. Um, and these camera measurements were sometimes supplemented with methane concentration measurements where you can use a handheld uh, sniffer. So you can get very close to the leaks like what is shown here. And when you use the camera, what you see, so this is an example where you record um, a, a potential leak and then you see if there is a leak, you see it as a small kind of smoky um, plume from the leak. Um, of course, uh, this is not uh, quantitative, so this can tell you whether you have a leak or not. Um, and if you are a skilled uh, uh, user of the camera, you can maybe also say something about, is it a medium, small, medium, large size uh, leak, but it will not tell you how much methane is emitted from the site. So to get uh, the total amount of methane emitted from the site, we quantified um, the methane emission using a tracer-based method. And this is what is shown in the slide. I hope it will soon come up. Yeah, so this measurement method is a method that we uh, developed many uh, years ago. Um, and what it does is that you release your methane on the site. So it's here is illustrated with a landfill, but it could uh, be a wastewater treatment plant or a biogas plant. And the tracer is then released together with the methane and downwind you drive through the plume with some very sensitive analytical um, equipment that monitors both the methane and your tracer. And what you then see is, I hope you can see the cursor here, when you drive, then you hit the plume, concentrations will go up. And when you then leave the plume again, you have this uh, nice concentration profile measured um, uh, at two meters height. And you can see they're very much uh, correlated and aligned. And then you use the ratio between these two compounds to uh, determine the emission of the methane from your site. And you know you can do this because you know how much uh, tracer you release. And the image down here shows how it looks like in real size. So it's a Google Earth image. And then you can see the concentrations of the tracer and the methane. And, and here you see um, a, a biogas plant. This is a method that is very well documented. Uh, we've done many controlled release tests and international comparison tests. And it's also been certified and has been applied at many, many different uh, sources. So now to some results. So um, in total, at these uh, uh, 60 plants, we identified uh, about 500 individual leaks. Um, and on average, we we saw that there uh, that the leaks were a little. The number of leaks uh, was a little bit higher for agricultural plants compared to uh, wastewater treatment plants. Um, and the reason for this difference may be that the agricultural plants in this studies were larger, um, had larger biogas production capacity in comparison to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, yeah, so these are some of the raw uh, data showing the whole plant methane emissions in kilomethane per hour. And then again, it's divided by agricultural plants and wastewater treatment plants. Um, and you can see that uh, emission rates, methane emission rates, they range between very little, so just a few kilos and up to uh, 80 kilos. And these numbers doesn't say very much, so you need to normalize the emissions. And normally what you normalize uh, with is the 
uh, methane production at the individual plants. This is what you see on the next slide. So this figure shows methane losses for, for different types of uh, biogas plants, so agricultural plants and wastewater treatment plants as a function of the methane uh, plant production. So that's the x-axis here, methane production. Um, and yeah, as I said earlier, the methane loss is given as a percentage of the production. Um, and that would then be the methane that, the share of the methane that it lost to the atmosphere. And you see a wide range of methane losses from something like 40% close to less than 1%. You also see that the highest methane losses are seen for the smaller plants, so plants in this uh, end of the scale where with lower uh, methane productions. And you, if you look at the different symbols, so the green for the agricultural plants and the blue uh, diamond for the wastewater treatment plants, you can see that we have many of the wastewater, the Danish wastewater treatment plants, they are here uh, with lower methane production. And this is also where we see the uh, higher methane losses. And there are many reasons for this, uh, but one uh, or some of the reasons are that if we look at these uh, very large agricultural biogas plants, many of them, they are very, they are recently built and they are also in the business for producing uh, energy. This is their main business. This is why they are there. Whereas the wastewater treatment plants, of course, today, they also want to be climate neutral and net energy producing and so on. Um, but their original purpose and still that's the main purpose is to uh, treat the wastewater. One thing that is also important to notice here, we're talking about some of these relatively big um, methane losses, is that we can also see, see here that it's actually technically possible to reduce the methane loss to less than uh, 1%. So this is, uh, I think, very important also to, to be aware of this. So we also calculated methane emission factors, and they are supposed to be used in the national inventory reporting. So they should represent uh, the total the total um, biogas production or biomethane production in Denmark. So how this is uh, done is then that we use now production weight based methane emission factors. So this way that the emission factor is calculated is that you take the sum of all emissions measured at the individual plants, you sum it up, and then you divide with the, uh, pr the total production across all plants. And then you get this uh, production waste-based methane emission factors. And for the agricultural plant, then it's 2.1. And for the wastewater treatment plants, this is then 6.7. And for if you look across all uh, plants, it's 2.5. And this is the Biogas Association. They had uh, put a target of a 1% uh, methane loss from all Danish uh, biogas production. So in comparison to this, this is actually um, uh, higher. Um, and if we look at what, is, what was used in the national inventory reporting for Denmark for wastewater treatment plant, the factor is 1.6. So what we measured is a bit higher. And whereas if we look at the agricultural uh, biogas plants, um, the factor that we got here is actually lower than what is used today. So, yeah, at, we, we then start discussing in the project whether these uh, emissions are actually dynamic. And we didn't have any resources to focus on this, but we did manage to measure at one uh, wastewater treatment plant. We measured um, for six days the emissions in the morning and then later in the day. Um, and this is the data that you can see here. And you can see that there is some variation during the week. And uh, unfortunately, um, the uh, process uh, uh, and regulation system didn't work this week. So we, we cannot really back it up and see how does this compare with the, for example, the methane uh, production or the inlet to the wastewater treatment plant. So but definitely more to, to look into. And then I get to the conclusion. So we see high variation in methane emissions so, and methane loss between biogas plants. We also saw that the smaller plants had higher losses than the bigger ones uh, that are often more recently built. 
and wastewater treatment plants, they had higher methane losses than agricultural plants. And I actually did forget to say the next one. So we looking at the type of, of uh, leakages, and others will come back to this later on, the most common leakages was pressure relief valves on digesters. And then especially for the wastewater treatment plants, we saw that uh, biomass storage, um, especially without gas collection, uh, was a typical source of methane at the wastewater treatment plants. And then we saw leakages at all different kinds of gas bearing components, gas storage, piping, inspection hatches, and so on. I would also say in general that the methane losses were higher than we expected, but there is hope because we could see that it is technically possible to operate a plan with a loss that is less than 1%. Um, and finally, I think we need a little bit more insight into the methane emission dynamic uh, in the future. So that was it. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Salada. That was a, a brilliant overview. Um, and I, I and and then we'll yeah we'll have a good a, a good number of follow-on presentations which link well to this. But one one question I just we've got um probably a, a a minute or two only, and then we'll hopefully have some time for questions at the end as well. But um, you mentioned the original motivation was because of the subsidies around biogas. Um, the Danish Energy Agency wanted to understand the climate change impact, and um and that was back in two thousand and. 16, I think you mentioned. And I just wondered, given, I mean, it's fa really fantastic to see this work that's been done and, you know, some very recent publications of these findings. This was all campaign-based monitoring, um, but it covered a large proportion of the facilities in Denmark. Where do you see the where do you see the trajectory going forward? How can how can the energy agency use this information to and, and how can the biogas producers use this information for um, for climate impact, I guess, just briefly, if you wouldn't mind to answer this yeah. question. So actually part of what we uh, were originally supposed to do was also to bring some ideas for how future regulation could uh, be implemented in the Danish biogas industry. And we did that, but it suddenly became rather political and then that it didn't survive into the final part, the final version of the report. Um, but what has been done now is that uh, there's been some new regulations. So um, it is now mandatory for the biogas uh, operator uh, to have an external uh, an external company to come and uh, measure their leaks with the using the camera method that I just quickly presented. Um, so they have to to do this, uh, and then there is also some specific things on how much time they have to fix the re uh, the leaks and so on. Unfortunately, there is no requirement on uh, having the emissions quantified. So, for example, these uh, total site methane emissions. Uh, but we have been told that they plan to redo this uh, project in a few years from now to see how this uh, leaks, this is a mandatory leak search at the different uh, sites, how that has worked in terms of reducing emissions. Brilliant. Thanks very much. And I think we'll hear more from um, Thomas as well. Um, but yeah, fantastic work. And we'll share some of the links as well um, to the work and, and hear again from Anders soon. So thank you so much, Charlotte. And with that, I'd like to pass across to Thomas. Um, if you could pr please introduce yourself first, Thomas, and then um, kick off, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Thomas Hansen. I'm from uh, Denver, Danish Water and Wastewater Associations. I don't know if you my video has started. I can't see it, but I hope it, it has. Um, I'm manager for data and benchmarking in, uh, in Denver. And uh, one of my main uh, work is to publicize anything about the Danish water sector. And I each year make this uh, water and features. I don't know if you have seen it. You've seen it in a short time. Uh, in addition to this work, I work a lot about uh, energy and uh, climate uh, assessments. But what we are talking about today is the uh, uh, method legislation. I think, am I in control now? I am. So, um, so my first slide is not very good because you can't read it. I know that. 
that is a schedule of, of the Danish water sector. If you want to know more about how big we are, you can see this uh, water and features. Find it on our homepage, water and features. Uh, it's telling something about uh, the Danish water sector. And Denmark is not a very big country. We only 5.8 million people. And this part over here uh, is uh, about the wastewater. We have about 100 wastewater companies in Denmark. We have about uh, 650 wastewater treatment plants. They treat about seven, 800,000 cubic meter. But what we are talking about today is the uh, 50 wastewater treatment plants uh, who have the biogas production. So the storyline for this new regulation is uh, shortly it was the Danish government who started set this target on 70% reduction in 2030. The next year, the Danish Minister of Environment set up goals uh, for the energy and climate neutrality for the Danish water sector. And uh, our biggest scope is, of course, uh, nitrous oxide and followed by the methane. Later this year, we got this report, Charlotte just told you about. It was not very good reading because the wastewater treatment plant had an emission on 7.7%. And it was a little bit more than we expected. And the national uh, accounting uh, inventory report used 1.3%. So we had to do something. And furthermore, later in 2021, there was COP26 in Glasgow. There was a global agreement of reducing a method, and it was signed by the Danish Minister of Energy. And he went home to his agency and said, we have to do something in Denmark. So in 22, there was a climate agreement. It was called Denmark can do it uh, more. Two, one of the points was to increase our biogas production so we could not use it this rushes biogas and a gas uh, we didn't want to buy anymore. And there was a regulation of methane, so we had to retail, uh, so we can uh, reduce our loss from biogas production. Um, and this regulation was uh, introduced here to January the 1st this year. It's not a very complicated uh, set of rules. It's actually have three main uh, issues. Uh, the first one is that all the biogas uh, production plants have to have a there's a requirement for a self monitoring program. And the second issue is that each year they should have a re review and leak detection uh, of the biogas plant. And there was an issue about you would set a, a maximum at one percent for the gas engine uh, and the methane upgrading plants. Most of the wastewater treatment plants in uh, in Denmark who have uh, biogas production use the biogas for producing electricity and district heating. That's why we have our gas engine and we have our emission from the engine. And uh, as Gerard told you, uh, the goal uh, is not to measure the total uh, methane emission from the plant. The goal is to manage uh, by managing the operation and maintain maintenance of the facilities uh, you hope you have a very good facilities and then you have a very low uh, uh, methane loss from the facilities. And the final goal is to end up with a mission at 1% of the biogas sector in Denmark. Uh, what is then included in this uh, requirement? Uh, it's only the biogas production facilities on the wastewater treatment plant that's included. That means that all the uh, aeration tanks, settling tanks, the other parts of the wastewater treatment plants, it's not included. It's first when the sluts have been through the sludge thickener and go into a re reactor. It started to be included in this regulation. Uh, then we have some gas and the uh, the gas pipes and the sluts is going through. We have some uh, closed slot storage and we have an open slot storage. This is one of the main problems for the wastewater treatment plants. And then we have the dewatering. And when we finish the dewatering, we are going outside the regulation because if you put in, in uh, internal slot storage, it's not included. Or when you put it on a trunk and drive it away, it's not included. So it's only the the biogas production plant that's included.
One of the first, uh, the first issue was that uh, all plants should uh, do the self-monitoring program. It's, uh, the proposed was, of course, if you do a weekly, monthly, and annual self-monitoring program, you find a lot of the small uh, emissions. You can fix it to uh, know that you have a, a very good plant. Uh, the agency made a template uh, for use for this one, so everybody almost gets this same kind of self-monitoring program, and the program has to be prepared in collaboration with an external company. This was one of the issues in the regulation. The other one is maybe the biggest one. Uh, there was a demand for an annual review of uh, your plant. It should be carried out by an external independent company. Uh, all the external independent companies have to be pre-approved by the Danish Energy Agency. There's a list on the website of the agency. There are now seven companies on the list. And furthermore, the agency published a template for reporting and guidance on how to do this review and what should be put in the report. Uh, and the review result, of course, in this report, and the report should be sent to, the, of course, the wastewater treatment plant, but also to the Danish energy agencies so they can follow what's, uh, what's, uh, uh, how they do the uh, biogas plant, sorry. Um, and then the review must be carried out every year. However, there is a possibility uh, of a couple of years that you can have a reduced frequency if you are having a wastewater treatment plant who are doing very well without any uh, big leakage. Um, the report, there was two uh, parts in the, the, the review. There was the leak detection of all gas carrying components. And the other one is identifying any other sources of methane losses. And for the wastewater treatment plant, it's uh, often the open slot storage. That's uh, the problem. When you first build this wastewater treatment plant and you have a uh, biogas production, you uh, build your storage as open because then you, the wind could blow all the methane so you didn't have any danger for explosion. Now it's the other way around. Now you have to cover it and maybe uh, and collect the, the air and the methane and upgrade the methane from the storage tanks too. The report must contain uh, they have to, uh, the external company have to review the self-monitoring program. If they find something below what we call, I don't know what it's called uh, in English, it's a significant limit. As I, if it's not very much, you have to put this one in your self-monitoring monitoring program. If you are finding something about this significant limit, then you have to put some recommendation for uh, uh, fixing it in the report. And of course, if you find any sources of methane or recommendation, it should put, uh, be put in the report too. And then the requirement said that if you uh, wastewater treatment paint, get this report with, uh, with findings above this significant uh, limit, they have to fix it. So uh, the agency expect that every time there is a problem, the, uh, the biogas production plant have to fix it. This is a... Uh, Quite nice, there's of course some problems. What is the definition of a significant li limit? How much should it, uh, it be before it's uh, uh, above the si significant limit and they'll have to fix it? And then of course, there's a problem about this external companies. Uh, they, are they have the responsibility for recommendations so you have to fix it and they have to write how to fix it. But we would like that it's a wastewater treatment plant. It's very fair that the report said you have a problem, but it's up to the wastewater treatment plant to uh, decide how to fix it. Um, the third part in the requirement was that there was a, it was a planning to set up a, a maximum emission from the biogas uh, uh, from the biogas engine or the upgrading plant uh, systems at 1%. Uh, about the uh, gas engine, there was a problem, two problems, actually. The goal was that it should be below 1%. 
it is very, it's not very easy even for a new engine or a newly refurbished engine to have an emission so low. It was actually almost impossible. And the other part was that we have two different agencies who would set up different requirements for the same emissions from the same gas engine. So we have this uh, Danish energy agency who would set up requirement for methane in the outlet from the engine. But also at the same time, we have the Danish environmental agency who has the requirement for the same outlet, but it's all for the NOxes. And this is not very good to have two agencies uh, putting up requirement for the same outlet. So right now we're discussing what to do. So later on, we expect there will be some requirement to to this outlet from the gas engine. About the upgrading plants, it's uh, 1st January 24. There's a uh, requirement that the maximum uh, emission should be 1%. But it's only one or two wastewater treatment plants who have an upgrading plant for power biomass. Short summary, uh, the new regulation, it's very simple actually, and it's based on the concept that a maintained plant uh, and uh, review of the facility will ensure as little methane leakage as possible. It is not chosen to make this uh, total uh, methane uh, measurement, as uh, Gilotta told you about, it's not in the requirement. Of course, you have to kick at the point sources. This is the gas engine. We have our demand coming later. Uh, and all this is put on the Danish uh, website, Danish Energy Agency websites, where you also can find the guidelines and templates, but I'm sorry, it's only in Danish so far, so I don't think you can read it. This was it in the first time. Any questions? Thanks, Thomas. That was... That was fantastic, um, and we're so happy to be bringing this webinar in English because, as you say, a lot of the um, otherwise all of this is 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 in Danish. So we all have to we have to learn another language to understand. And I think the the progressiveness um, of the energy agency, but I guess also the um, the it seems like the collaborative nature of the work that's been done has involved academia, it's involved the utilities and the biogas facilities, as well as, um, as well as Danva, as well as the regulators. Um, it's, it's very nice to see. Uh, and, and clearly it's driving progress because now you, you're able to present the requirements. Um, I've got a question, a question here that we might, um, yeah, we have time we have time for um and actually patrick's just raised it um are the are the new regulations a, a a disincentive for utilities to build new biogas facilities or what is the landscape here you mentioned the lack of upgrading there's a lot of local use for biogas um how do you see this no, uh, we, we don't build new uh, biogas production on wastewater treatment plants. I think we have all the plants we can have now. All the new uh, biogas plants will be at agriculture, and they will be new and big. Um, so, uh, so uh, sorry, I, I didn't... Uh, I don't, I don't know. If yeah. That, uh, so, but. and what about the upgrading? I mean, you mentioned a lot of the use is local. Yeah. I think yeah. what's interesting is in some other geographies, like in the UK, for example, there's a lot of the incentives have been to upgrade the biogas. And actually, depending on the upgrading technology, the methane slip can be very large through different technologies. Um, yeah. The, the upgrading is mainly for the big uh, uh, biogas plants. Many of the plants on the wastewater treatment plant is too small. They don't have enough biogas to uh, finance this upgrading uh, systems. Uh, we would like to do it, uh, but it's mainly too small. I think we only have two or three wastewater treatment plants who have to, uh, enough biogas to upgrade it. Otherwise, we can collect it to one uh, central upgrading plant, and then you have to transport it by, by trucks. Yeah, so, thank so you. Really interesting. Electricity. Yeah. Um, good, thanks. And I can see, hey, Steve, I can see a question here, which I think we'll tackle in the, the final discussion as well. Um, uh, with that, I think 
I would like to say thank you very much, Thomas. Um, and I'd like to pass back to Danish Technical University and um, back to Anders um, to introduce himself and present this really interesting case study from the work that he and Charlotte have done. Thanks, Anders. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Amanda. Um, so a brief introduction of myself. My name is Anders Fremslund. I'm a senior researcher at the Technical University of Denmark. I work in remote sensing of fugitive emissions, and I'm a colleague of Chilotis and has worked in this uh, project that Chilotis gave an overview of uh, earlier. So I have a background in environmental engineering, uh, and uh, within that, waste management and bioenergy. So from from now, so for this presentation, we are going to address a, a very specific subject. But um, but one one that is highly important uh, within this overall uh, thing that we are uh, discussing here. Um, so at the agenda for my presentation is just to give uh, an explanation on what pressure relief valves are and why they are focus focus point. So I'm going to uh, show methods and results regarding uh, this source of emission from this Danish national effort to minimize methane emissions. Uh, then I'm going to, uh, to, to use some other people's results. So for the first one is a, a German study, that's point number three here, where they have uh, observed emission rates from installed pressure relief wells or breather wells for short. Um, and then uh, I will use some uh, UK results uh, that shows that uh, valves may leak at different rates uh, depending on, on the quality of the valves. I will draw some conclusions and list some additional information after that. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so what are pressure relief valves? And I think I would call them breather valves from now on because that's a bit easier. So, so the purpose of these valves are to ensure a set maximum pressure difference between a tank, such as a digester at a wastewater treatment plant, um, and that is to prevent rupture or implosion of the tank. So the, the valve can either take in air or, or release uh, pressure from the tank. So, for example, if you change liquid levels uh, in the tank, you may need to draw in air or release air. Uh, it could also be that um, there's a lot of gas production going on and not enough gas use. Uh, there are probably a lot of different things that can uh, cause uh, these valves to open and uh, emit excess air or, or the other way around to take in air from the atmosphere into the digester. I, I'm not an expert in, in this, but uh, but you can consider there are two types of emissions that are these functional emissions that I am, that I talked about that are the very purpose of the valve, and then there are also uh, what you can consider as leakage, mean, meaning unwanted emissions where where the pressure difference is not uh, the cause of emission. I will go back into that. So they are, let's say, a well-known and often observed cause of leakage from top of biogas reactors. And uh, the purpose of reducing emissions from this source is, of course, to, uh, to avoid a contribution to climate change and uh, also to, in, uh, to uh, avoid loss of energy produced at the digester and thus revenue, uh, potentially. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, Charlotte showed these figures before. So in, in this national effort in Denmark, we, we used uh, thermal imaging to, uh, to identify sources of methane emission. Also, these uh, sniffers where you can measure concentration. And uh, leakage from pressure release wells, either intended uh, or functional uh, emission, you can say all leakage as such, that was observed at more than half of facilities and uh, 89 times in all uh, emissions from uh, pressure relief wells were observed. Now, as part of the project, we, we, we did not uh, quantify emissions from all emission sources, and that uh, includes these uh, breather wells. Um, so we only counted the, the number of leakages and uh, as I said, that occurred in more than half. Next slide, please. 
Um, however, there are some uh, results that, that give an indication on, on uh, what mitigation of this uh, loss rate um, can, can mean for a biogas plant. So at six biogas plants in the project, we measured uh, total methane emission before uh, the plant had an uh, opportunity to reduce their emission. And then we measured methane emission at the plant afterwards. We used the tracer gas dispersion method that Shilada uh, shown before. And um, the result was that uh, they, the six plants in all, they avoided uh, loss of methane converted into a yearly rate of about 1.5 million normal cubic meters, which is uh, equal to almost 30,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. So that is, uh, of course, uh, also a significant uh, revenue increase, and it's it's a very important point that some of these um, uh, emission sources, if you if you reduce the emission, you have actually can generate revenue that may uh, partially finance or even entirely finance emissions. Uh, this, these mitigation actions, but but anyway, the loss before uh, from these six plants were were three point seven percent and loss after was reduced to 2.1%. And um, that is uh, the loss rate in percent that is measured emission uh, divided by total uh, production at the site. At all these six plants, the pressure relief wells were replaced. So uh, I think I saw a question in the Q&A, what can we do? <laughs> One thing is that you can, uh, if you have leaky pressure relief wells, you can uh, exchange them. And uh, there, there are some results on payback time and, uh, that I will come back to. Next slide, please. Now, now I will move on to uh, related results from other people. So uh, recently there was a, a, a study published um, by two German researchers, uh, Thorsten Reinelt and Jan Liebetrau, where they had measured uh, emissions from uh, two pressure relief valves, one at a main digester and, and one from uh, covered digested storage at, at a biogas plant. And here they, they measured emission rate continuously. So I cannot go into detail with the measurement method, but, but anyway, their results was that um, they, the emission rate was quite varying. Uh, they saw some correlation between maintenance works and emission rate. Uh, also, some uh, temperature effects that caused uh, emission rates to spike. So, um, if I just explain the, the figure we are looking at briefly, you see time on the x axis, so that shows the whole calendar year, and you see uh, emission factors from the two valves uh, as the bar graphs. Um, and uh, the dark one is from the main digester and the light one is from the digestate storage. And you can see that at some points in time, it goes all the way up to 10% of, of production. That is, of course, quite unfortunate, both for uh, climate uh, and, both, and also for uh, financial reasons. So the overall emission factor for the first year of, of uh, observation was 1.8%. Um, and for the second year and after they had done some mitigation uh, um, work, and you can read about that in the paper uh, shown here, um, uh, they had reduced the, the emission factor to 0.6%. Uh, I, I actually can't remember if they also changed the valve uh, or if it was just a management of the operation of the facility. But uh, please uh, consult that uh, paper for to see what was done to reduce emission. Now, uh, also uh, now we go to the UK, where uh, another uh, uh, good work is being done, and um, this time from the company Essentech and uh, a person called Ewart Cox and, and uh, his colleagues. Um, they are they have developed a test bench to ten to test these uh, breather valves. And what they test is uh, leakage uh, at certain set points, meaning set point is the, is the uh, point of pressure difference where the wind is uh, opening. So when they set it, for example, at 90% of the set point, uh, there, you, there, there, you can have leakage 
from from good wells at almost nothing, and from other wells that uh, they refer to at bad wells, not to uh, name any bad names, but uh, that is significantly higher. You can see here, uh, that is test results from a demonstration they, they gave to me, that uh, they measured leakage from a good pressure relief valves at uh, less than five cubic meters per year, so practically nothing, and leakage from a bad pressure relief valve at uh, 1,700 cubic meters per year, which is significant. Now, uh, very relevant, uh, they also provided example of financials, and they will, of course, depend on a lot of things. Uh, rate of leakage, uh, the gas production of the facility, energy cost and everything. But uh, they, uh, anyway, uh, they, they, when asked, they gave me an answer about cost and benefit. So here they, they had a price of a good valve versus a bad valve. So the good valve is, is uh, more than twice as expensive. But anyway, uh, the saving from reduced leakage from, uh, from these two different quality of valves was so, so high that the payback time was uh, less than a year or about 10 months. So uh, I think everybody will be uh, satisfied with, with that payback time. Um, so that is a good example in, in my uh, point of view. So to conclusions, uh, leakage from pressure relief valves is, uh, is a very often observed source of methane emission from biogas production. That is probably not uh, new to, to, uh, to all of us here, but, uh, but just to, to lay that clear, and that was also the result of our study. And uh, a reminder that emission can both be a result of the uh, valve functioning as they should, and it can come from leakage. Uh, so it's important that you have high quality valves that are well maintained. You can have highly varying rates of leakage uh, from normal operation um, where uh, very gas tight valves can have near zero leakage. And uh, leakage from pressure relief wells can cause a significant loss of revenue and greenhouse gas emission. So here I list some additional information that is uh, relevant when to, to this specific subject. First, a research paper that uh, shall also, shall also uh, mention in the Q&A that is uh, uh, discussing this uh, project that we have been working on, uh, not only on relief wells, and then the specific research paper by the two uh, Germans that I mentioned here. And uh, then uh, in emission calculator where you can uh, estimate what you lose in, 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 in gas and, and, um, and money if you don't have the good wells. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anders. That was a very, very interesting case study. Um, there's a there's a few questions um, that I can see in the Q&A box. And I, I think one that draws some of them together is you mentioned that, you know, it can be that we need to, we have bad valves, but it can also be the operational conditions or the set points of existing valves. And in your, in your view or from, from the interventions at those six sites, I think they were valve replacements, or maybe some of them were optimizations. What? Yeah. How do? How do we deal? How do? How do we differentiate? Because it appears clear we can take action now if we want to. So, yeah. what are the viable steps that a utility can take or a biogas facility can take to understand? Yeah, I, here I'm probably not the right one to to answer. So, so I'm a measurement uh, specialist. <laughs> So I, I observe emissions, and, and and I can't really distinguish if the, if it's due to function or, or or what it is. But I can answer what I've been told about the owner of these six facilities. So it it's a producer that it's the same owner of all facilities, and they said that uh, well they 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 looked at the reports. So they had two reports, both our our tracer gas dispersion report and uh, the report of the leak search um, and uh, they decided that that they in their estimation it will be financially beneficial for them to uh, exchange the, the valves and they just decided to exchange everyone's all uh, valves uh, so i i think the of course they are as all they they want to emit as few greenhouse gases as they can 
but it also, as they told me, I mean, they, they will start with the one that have a short payback time. Uh, and wells that that increases their their revenue basically so 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 they didn't see a problem with, with replacing in that in all the cases and uh, and just a follow up question on that thank you um the tracer gas dispersion modeling i mean it's a site level a site wide approach but actually can you tell us does it what granularity can it give us about individual valves it uh, does not give any granularity about individual valves uh, as it was used here. So we used it to measure total methane emission from the site. Now, including in the measurement protocol, we also uh, do a, a screening uh, at the site to determine where to release tracer gas. and that But that determines the area where emission occurs, but not specific emission sources. So uh, it's very good at, at quantifying the total emission rate, uh, doing that very precisely. We've, we've tested the accuracy of the method, um, but it's uh, in itself not very good at, at determining um, individual emission sources. So a combination of leak search and, and uh, quantification of total emission is, in my point of view, a good compromise and a good uh, combination of, of measurement methods. Thanks very much. Yeah. And Can I give a short comment to that also? Of course. Um, and what, what was it actually that you said? Sorry, I lost it, Anas. I said that the combination of tracer gas yeah. and, so, so, and, and no, I, is very useful. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, you can also quantify uh, emission rates from all these different leakages. So what you normally do is that then you have to encapsulate the leakage and then you use a, a flow chamber and then you measure flow and uh, methane concentrations, and then you can get the emission rate. So there are standard and ISO standards to do this kind of measurements. Um, and it's, for example, in Sweden, they do this uh, as part of their voluntary um, measurement program. It's quite laborious, but I mean, there are the methods they do exist, but then you go by each leakage and then you um, quantify it in this way. And we have done some studies where we worked uh, together with uh, people who would do these kind of measurements. And then when we sum up the emission rates from all these different leakages, and then we compare with the total measured emission from the site, often we see that the total methane emission site is a little bit uh, bigger um, in comparison to the total sum of all these small leakages. And I think this is obvious because it's you do not always find all the leakages. If you do a leak search with the camera, there is also some sensitivity issues. If it, the leakage is not really localized, you might not see it. You may not see it. So, of course, there are, there are also leakages that are difficult to find because maybe they're on the top of the reactors or, you know, places where it's difficult to access. So, but there are methods out there where you can quantify emission rates from individual leakages. And just one question on that um, from Gemma Charlotte. Uh, I mean, there's the optical gas imaging cameras that um, some which claim to quantify or, you know, with some modelling software can quantify a mass emission. What, what are, can you share a little on, on this? Um, not so sure. Um, I, I know that, uh, that, that they have tried to, to um, do tests where you then yeah use these tests to get some yeah to um calibrate you can say these cameras so you actually get emission rates or flow rates so i would not dare to say how precise these are no oh, thanks and i think this is an interesting point around the you know very rigorous um largely you know a lot of the work that's been done to date has been you know very strongly academic with the, particularly all of what you and your team have supported and then I think and then we have a lot of the utility work which perhaps is focused on uh, leak detection and repair and optical gas imaging and I think understanding how each of these can fit uh, can contribute to the puzzle that we need to solve on methane is really important so thank you um, yes. and thanks Anders and with that it's a good time to hand across to our um, our leading uh, climate smart utility on the call here. Um, per Henrik, if you would mind introducing, if you would mind to introduce yourself and um, look forward to hearing your case study. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here and uh, presenting uh, our work on uh, our methane journey in, 
BCS Denmark. My name is Pierre Henry Nielsen. Uh, I'm I work for the utility, and my responsibility in utility is to uh, to to do a lot of the development work and to oversee the development project. And I've been so lucky to uh, work together with both Charlotte and Anders for, for quite some time. And I'll get back to that. So just a few words on uh, on BCS. We're in a, a utility in the middle of Denmark, established uh, way back in time, and we are the third largest city in Denmark. We are supplying drinking water and wastewater services to our customers, uh, and uh, we have worked very vigorously on being energy neutral, and uh, we have been energy neutral since 2019. And at the same time, we are committed to innovation. So we are not scared of, of uh, diving deep into uh, new projects and uh, and that uh, uh, and off streets at night. So uh, I I have a lot of uh, work to do there on, on innovation. Just to set the scene, we have eight wastewater treatment plants. By far, the biggest is IP Müller at the the, the the southern part of, of our uh, uh, service area. And we have a number of, of small wastewater treatment plants scattered over a bigger area. There are a few figures here on, on, on our service uh, system. This is a picture of uh, IP Müller wastewater treatment plant. It's an old plant uh, established in 1907, uh, and we've been rebuilding it ever since. So it's scattered all over the place, and uh, we have all kinds of gadgets and, uh, and uh, treatment processes uh, we have quite stringent, stringent uh, discharge limits, so we're sitting around uh, a total nitrogen of four and uh, in, in point three in phosphorus uh, milligram per liter. So, so we uh, are uh, having a, a good time in trying to to clean the water as well as possible, and at the same time, we make good use of the biogas we produce in our digestive system. As I said, we have worked very a lot on on, uh, on becoming energy neutral and this is a chart indicating that uh, we as a utility right now are energy self-sufficient we are producing more uh, electricity and heat we can sell the, the heat to district heating in denmark which is very important uh, and uh, we are we are selling more energy than what we are producing so for us it's it has been a, a long battle or uh, interesting fights to to become energy neutral, and we have shown that it is possible for a, a, a decent sized utility to uh, to really work hard on energy balance and and produce a substantial amount of, of both electricity and heat that can be sold to the net. But what is what is the future, and what does the future hold for us? Uh, the energy mix in Denmark has been decarbonized quite a bit. So we're looking into new challenges uh, for our system because uh, earlier on, the best way of, of reducing CO2 emission were to, uh, to, to produce new, new green energy. But due to the fact that uh, Denmark are producing a lot of uh, green energy uh, in the grid, we do not have the same footprint anymore from, from uh, our, uh, our energy production, our energy consumption in, in our utility, meaning that that it gets more and more important for us to reduce our emissions. That being methane, of course, and the nitrous oxide being the biggest problems that we are seeing uh, in the future and that we have already now because the footprint of our energy consumption is quite low and, uh, and therefore m uh, emissions are the biggest problem that we are facing now whilst we have uh, this energy self-sufficient in, uh, in our system. We've been working on, uh, on on trying to describe our uh, our footprint uh, in our SDG reporting. We've been reporting, uh, having a SDG reporting for, for quite some years, and and looking into greenhouse gas gas protocol, uh, we are struggling a little bit uh, in different scopes. So scope one and two uh, are the normal the scopes that you are you are reporting on, uh, and and they are re rather limited. Uh, footprints that we are looking at uh, right now compared to scope three, which we are battling right now, uh, and to, to see if we can reduce our scope three emission. Um, and outside scope uh, is, a, is a, a, another problem. Biogas, uh, biogenic is CO2 and, uh, and, uh, and, and CO2 from, from green or from combustion engine, our, our in gas engine that we are producing energy from 
is a CO2 footprint, but it's outside scope. Um, and and that means that we, we need to address that as, as well as a problem. So for us, emissions has become more and more uh, important in our in our uh, work on, on trying to become uh, more sustainable in, in our uh, our work. At the same time, we are very, it's very important for us not to get carbon tunnel vision. Uh, a lot of work has been done on, on carbon emission uh, and, and looking uh, only at carbon emission. For us, it's important to, to look broad and, uh, and, and being able to look uh, at, at different other impact factors. Eutrophication uh, is one that we have uh, something to do with uh, biodiversity as well and, and air pollution. So for us, uh, we, we are looking into a, a situation where we are making sure that we don't get carbon tunnel vision, but have a keen eye on, on, the, uh, on the problems related to, uh, to uh, emissions as such. We've heard a lot uh, about measuring and problems with, uh, with methane, and, uh, but, but nobody are doing something about it. Uh, Charlotte and Anders are measuring and, uh, and Thomas are finding out how to regulate it. But at the end of the day, we are the one that needs to do something about it. The wastewater treatment people can do something about it. So we, we had this, uh, this project, uh, uh, we are finalizing this project right now where, where the aim is to reduce emissions from wastewater treatment. Methane and nitrous oxide are the main problems. Um, and it's a cooperation between utilities, universities, uh, consultants, and it's partly funded by the Danish EPA. So they are, they are so nice to give us some money to, to, to help uh, us, us conduct these projects. The project includes a new advanced sludge handling, uh, advanced measurement uh, at the treatment plants. That's what Anas and uh, Shalotta are doing, advanced measurement in sewer system. We had this question, do we have a, do we have a problem in our sewer system? Do we actually account for the for the methane production in the sewer system? And I I, I think that uh, we have we can conclude now that it's a minor problem compared to to the wastewater treatment. We did expect that somehow, but uh, it is nice to know. And, and Anas has been uh, very eagerly measuring in the sewer system as well and trying to understand where we have the hotspots. We have the uh, had some pilot testing on the nitrous oxide uh, enhanced control strategy for, for minimizing that and looking at new online measurements. We have uh, in VCS participated in the, uh, in, in the liquid phase online measurement of, of nitrous oxide since 2010. And we now think that it's, it's, there's a need to, uh, to widen out our, our approach on, on that as well. So what did we do about it? Uh, we uh, we decided that our old sludge storage uh, was was not very good because uh, it really emitted a lot of uh, of, of uh, methane. Anas could prove that, and uh, so that was not a big surprise to us. Uh, so it is like having a petrol tank where you where your petrol is running out. So why not why not try to to, to close it? And uh, therefore we closed the tank and built a new one. Uh, with a lid on and uh, making sure that the, the pressure relief well is, is a good one, so we don't lose any any uh, any unwanted release to to the atmosphere. Another thing we did was to, to look at the dissolved the methane in the sludge, uh, and that is a problem because in the, the sludge, when it comes out of the uh, digestion system, there's a rather large amount, a relatively big amount of methane dissolved in the uh, in the fluid, and we have uh, we have uh, looked at different technologies, but uh, settled on a, on a system where we are running it through a, a vacuum system. So we actually release the uh, the uh, uh, the methane from from the sludge stream, uh, including uh, a, a addition of magnesium because the struvite precipitation would be a problem if we didn't control that at the same time. So what did we do about it? Yeah, we plan we. We bought a plant from Iliq, uh, Ilovac P, it's called, uh, and installed that. It, I still believe that it's the biggest installation that uh, they have, have done. And, uh, and we are busily trying to get it to operate uh, stable right now. But it's, it's, it's been good to us. And one added uh, effect on that is that we, uh, 
get better sludge dewatering when we get the, the methane out. And that's uh, really a, a, a big benefit for, for, for the operation. It's not a huge amount of, of biogas we get out of the system compared to, to, the, to the flow. Uh, it's a few percent, uh, two or three percent of, of, the, of the total uh, biogas uh, that we are extracting from the, from the sludge. But it, it's still it, it's, uh, an emission that's prevented and uh, therefore we, we see that as a, as a necessary and good upgrade of the system. Finding the emissions is really a, a big problem, uh, despite the fact that Anas and Shalotta uh, have shown very good meth methods to it, because there are these, these big variations. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, we have done a lot of campaigns, and, uh, and now we have, where we have solved the, the problem with the sludge uh, storage facility and the, the sludge from the digester, we are looking in different other directions. Uh, Primary clarification is certainly a problem that we need to address, and we do see a, a problem there. So I, I think that's next on our hit list for, for doing something on, on methane. Uh, but there will always be a, 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 a biggest emission from one spot on the treatment plant. So, so finding the emissions is, is, is really important, and uh, having good methods to, uh, to, uh, to help solve that problem is, is uh, really important. Conclusion on, on the Irish project, um, it is possible to, uh, for, for utilities to minimize uh, the emissions. It takes a, a, a bit of effort, uh, but, uh, but it, is, it is not impossible. And uh, with, with sound regulation and uh, good initiatives uh, and uh, cooperation with uh, universities, it is possible to, to, uh, to find methods to, to minimize it. And, and it is really just uh, making sure that you don't lose your, your petrol from your petrol tank. Minimizing a well-known source of uh, methane emissions, uh, we knew already that, uh, that the, the sludge uh, storage facility was a big problem and, and the dissolved the methane was a big problem. And we have clearly shown that it's possible to, to eliminate that problem. Try to find other emission sources uh, we do find emissions everywhere on the treatment plant, uh, and uh, during warm summer it's different than cold winters, and uh, we have a number of problems. We are addressing those, and uh, as, as long as we take them one by one, uh, I'm, I'm sure that we will be able to to uh, uh, to optimize our system and minimize our emission. We tested control strategies uh, to uh, to get a lower emission uh, for from the operation. Um, and we've been working on uh, on the nitrous oxide uh, as well on this project, and we are evaluating the validity of uh, the IPCC reporting uh, from from Denmark based on the findings that uh, that we have from this project. It's a great team. We have the all the biggest uh, utilities in Denmark uh, uh, working on it, uh, and uh, the leading uh, consultant and the best university. So. So what can go wrong, and uh, it has been a, and is a re really good uh, project and a good cooperation. I think I'll conclude and uh, leave to uh, over, leave over to Amanda to uh, to lead the discussion. Thanks, Pat Henrik. A, a really interesting um, presentation. Um, and I think we've done very, very good at answering lots of questions in the Q&A as well. So thank you. Thank you, team. Um, so maybe just one, one I wanted to ask you, Per Henrik, and then maybe we can ask all of everyone to come on camera and we have a wider discussion. But um, uh, we, we've discussed, Thomas presented the, um, you know, the, the, the regulations which don't require facility level quantification or, or even process unit quantification. But you've mentioned obviously your, your next, one of your next tasks for methane might be primary settlement tanks. Um, what, as a, you know, as a utility who's leading in this space of process emissions, what is it, does this look like a series of projects that you do or are you doing a regular, um, obviously there's the one-off quantification studies that have, um, have been part of these fantastic academic collaborations, but what are your sort of day-to-day -day or, you know, week-to-week, year-to-year um, commitments or what, what do you see for yourself as a utility having to do to um, 
satisfy regulatory requirements, but also to achieve what your objectives are, which, um, you know, which no one is forcing you to do right now, but I think you're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, basically that's, that's correct, Amanda. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do. We have a strategy saying that we want to, to, uh, to be sustainable in, in our operation and, and therefore we can justify taking the responsibility of, of, of doing something with, with, with problems that we see in our operation. We take them, there's a, of course a limit to our investment the capacity and the, how, how fast we can, we can rectify these problems. But, but, uh, but we are eager to pursue that and, uh, and, uh, and we regularly uh, check our system whether we have leaks uh, uh, as we are supposed to and we've done that uh, earlier on as well and, and close some of the leaks uh, that we have found. Uh, so now it's, it's getting into something that's more difficult uh, uh, covering uh, primary tanks that are not uh, meant for being covered is uh, a practical problem, uh, but we might be able to operate them differently uh, depending on, on the year, uh, on, on the time of the year and the temperature and stuff like that and reduce some emissions. Uh, we have actually trickling filters at the, our wastewater treatment plant, which is a, a very old technology. We have that due to the fact that we, uh, we need to reduce uh, ammonia pressure on the receiving water body during rain. We have combined sewers, so we have trickling filters. We expect that we have a problem there in relation to, uh, to, uh, to nitrous oxide. Or could have, uh, we need to, to quantify that. So we have a number of, of, of projects still uh, at hand. Uh, Deammonification, uh, Animox process that is burping a substantial amount of nitrous oxide needs to be stopped in that. So we're looking at catalytical processes. So, so there's a number of projects that, that still are in development and uh, under consideration. So, so we have, I, I'll be busy quite some years to, to come. Thanks for Henrik and we'll obviously hear more about nitrous oxide um, also at our, at our next webinar um, which Anna Katrine and um, Jakob will be hosting which will be really interesting also. Um, uh, and around the cost effectiveness for Henrik, final one, um, the, I mean I think on going back to nitrous oxide I think there's a little bit of a um, utilities want to see for example a tax on um, or they want to see incentives that then allow the funding mechanisms to address the monitoring requirement and the mitigation cost. Um, what about for methane? Because um, obviously the cost of covering tanks, the, you know, let you mention the inadequate infrastructure. How how do you see this being funded? There's obviously a lot of it seems more more progressive regulators there because the energy agency and the EPA are potentially involved. But how do you see this challenge around the cost the cost to intervene and mitigate methane? Yeah, it's it's a large business case as it is right now. I mean, the, the methane that we 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 extract from from the vacuum system and from uh, from the, the covered uh, sludge storage facility will never will not pay for for the uh, for for, uh, for for the installation. So we are we we're not necessarily hoping for for more stringent regulation, but incentives would be nice. So so. If we are best in class or we do something that we are, at least it's, it's financially justified that we are doing it. And we see that as a, as a little bit of a problem with the Danish uh, regulation, uh, the Danish financial regulation of the utility, which is not very favorable for, 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 for doing the right thing for the world, but more for, for the finances. So, so there are some dilemmas we are still uh, uh, battling there, but, uh, but I think that in many cases, something like these breather valves that uh, Anas was talking about can be justified in normal operation or relatively easy being justified. Going to the extent with a vacuum extraction system and, uh, and uh, a fully covered tank, it's difficult to justify in some cases, unfortunately. Thanks for Henrik. Should we... Um yeah, just maybe open up into a, um, I don't know if, uh, William, if you stop sharing, we can let others come on the screen for a bit. Um, just to, to perhaps if anyone wants to, I wanted to actually ask all of the panellists if possible, um, and I think Per Henrik's probably answered a bit already, but um, what we've learned a lot about the Danish programme um, and the work that's taken place, and I guess um, 
what are some of the remaining or what have been the reasons why it's been successful or if areas haven't been successful, what are the challenges left and what do we, you know, what we mentioned some of the gaps, but why has it, it seems to be much more progress than we see in other countries and other sectors. Um, and it was across sectors, it's not just water, it's also the wider biogas sector. So I just wondered, um, maybe Thomas, if you don't mind to start, um, uh, what do you see as some of the, the, the reasons for the success? If you feel it's a success from an outsider's perspective, it very much looks, looks successful compared with what we see in, in other areas, although, uh, you know, everyone's catching up, hopefully. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it was a success, it was more like a surprise when we got this report from Gerard. That it was not, we was not running very well. So, I, I think PIA is a very fine example of the Danish water treatment plants because we want to do it right. We want to do it better. We want to do it uh, in the right way if we can. So, I, I think it's in our system that we want to do it in a in a good way. So, I, I can't see it why we doing better than other ones. But we had this focus ten years ago. And now it's paying time by new regulation, but I think it's the regulation is good. It put focus on the problems. Thanks. Anyone else want to come in or, or um Yes, I would like to, to also comment on this on the same question. I think uh, one thing you can say is that we don't really know if it's successful uh, yet. Um, I, th I think we need to quantify the effect of this regulation, and, and as Celotte briefly mentioned, that that will take take place in a, in some time, and then hopefully you, you will see a decrease in emission factor, uh, showing if, if the regulation has worked or not. Uh, that is not to stop any, anyone else from doing anything. It's just, uh, but uh, we don't really have proof uh, on the effectiveness yet, except for for maybe the figure that I showed that. That it is possible for if you, if you go and, and monitor these uh, these plants and they uh, uh, the, the the operators and the owners of the plant can can see for themselves uh, where the emissions occur, then it, we have found that it is possible for them to measurably reduce their emissions. So so that is a, a positive sign, I would say. Thanks, Anders. So maybe I can comment uh, a bit also. So. If I now keep a positive uh, perspective here, I think one of the reasons is also that the Danish government, and that's actually across uh, most of the parties, political parties that they agreed on, and that we should have a very ambitious um, climate act and set very ambitious reduction targets. So I think Denmark, if we were not the first, at least one of the first countries to say, okay, we aim for a 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and climate neutral by 2050. Nowadays, this happened in the end, I think they signed the act in the end of 2019. So it was probably discussed in the year up to that date. Um, so, um, so today there are many more countries that have similar uh, targets. And so that's very good. Um, but I think, I mean, when you do this, you also need to follow up. And I'm not saying that things are uh, going well in Denmark, uh, but but we are at this, I mean, 2030, that's just a few years from now, right? Uh, when we talk about implementing new technologies and so on. So So there are a lot of actions being taken across different sectors. So we have... Uh, had actions in the waste sector and in the water sector. They are reporting in the same uh, sector, actually, but also now in agriculture. And it's it's not it's not uh, easy. And the reason why it's not easy because I think we have a very good reporting system. Um, with the IPCC, they give guidelines on how to account the emissions and so on. And so that's very good because it's a transparent system, so we can compare across uh, countries. Um, but we don't actually know how well the true emissions they um, or how close the true emissions are to these, you can say, calculated or accounted emissions. And now the government, the Danish government, they take political actions, and also they're discussing this: should we have a climate tax or anything? Not. On, on these also, on these, um, yeah, you can say non-CO2 gases and so on. 
And then, of course, it becomes quite important that you are actually that you actually know the true emissions and not some arbitrary calculated estimated emissions, because now it suddenly affects companies' economy and also the budget that is allocated to reduce emissions uh, if there are some uh, national support. Um, so, so yeah. So I don't know. I think there's. There is this, at least there is this uh, realization that, you know, there are not that many years to 2030. So action needs to be taken. And we actually all do not always know our baseline emissions. Thanks, Charlotte. And I think, you know, the IPCC, um, well, for, for methane, you know, from methane from wastewater treatment, you know, there's a, there's a factor there. I think methane from sludge management is sort of a, between zero and 10%, and we pick a number between that. So I think the, but then obviously that's at tier one, and then, you know, the recommendation, the guideline is we need tier three, we need facility level monitoring. But I think the, you know, there's no obligation on countries, that's, you know, up to them within the means of the country to, um, support that facility level monitoring and then even when we have the facility level monitoring how that perhaps informs improved emission factors so that at a at a country level in that waste sector we can actually show tangible reduction I think there's a lot of still yet to be answered questions and I guess we rely a lot on the progressive utilities and you know the momentum from as you say across uh, uh, across um, partisan across political parties as well to drive progress because it's not clear that it will it, it is not clear how it yeah how it comes without that motivation from from yeah from the utilities plus the regulators and we are certainly not seeing this in every country at all so any anyone else want to um, share any other thoughts or hopes um, <laughs> I can well people are thinking I can share another thought. So, I mean, I think I personally have waited quite a long time for regulation. So government has to make decisions and take actions. But there is also a new tendency, and that's actually that the customers, that they start to require um, that, that when they, for example, um, so for example, the Copenhagen municipality, when they, have to make a decisions on where should they um, put the source separated organic household waste, where should that be sent for treatment at a biogas plant. Then they would require that the biogas plant can actually show uh, that they have control on their methane emissions. And it could be the same. I know I had a meeting some time ago with the mask shipping, and they also start to say, okay, we, we're not going to buy uh, biomethane from a biogas plant where they cannot show that they have control on their methane losses. So, I mean, it's a little bit of a new tendency, I think, and it, we know it also just from the general public that they start to ask just to require that there is a certain level of information uh, on these things available for them to make decisions uh, based on these, on this. So, yeah. Yeah, and they're, you know, they're someone's scope one emissions or someone else's scope three emissions. So if we start to do proper accounting, and I guess we, we also want to come to this in the fourth webinar in the series, then um, we know it's all interconnected and having um, having good guidance and robust accounting is, yeah, so important. Thank you. Um, with that, maybe we, um, I think we've, we've done really well on the questions. Um, and I think maybe we'll go back to the slides, William, and just um, we've got a few um, um, just a, a few notes, but um, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to um, to all the presenters. Really fantastic, and there's lots of links, and I really would recommend reading the um, or machine translating. Um, but there's a lot of excellent papers in English, obviously published in peer-reviewed journal journals, particularly um, from the work of Charlotte Hernandez. That very very useful, um, looking across the whole biogas. Um, chain as well. But um, next, on the 4th of September, we've got um, the monitoring mitigating nitrous oxide. So again, um, learning from some of the, the Danish experience there. And then our fourth and final webinar on the 3rd of October will be um, brought by our Iowa um, Greenhouse Gas Working Group and, and really broadening the conversation um, to wider emissions as well. And then just a short note on two upcoming webinars there, which both look extremely interesting and you can sign up. 
Um, you can also become a member of IWA. Um, and we also have a greenhouse gas um, within the Climate Smart Utilities group. We do have a small working group. Um, we're currently producing a white paper on um, nitrous oxide monitoring, and we want to do one on methane as well. And of course, we'll draw on some of the expertise in, in the webinar here to hopefully help help us review that. But um, And the idea would be to, to provide some nice utility information, um, which which currently is, is lacking. So um, if you would like to hear more about that, please feel free to get in touch um, with, with Iowa um, and to check out the, the Climate Smart Utilities page as well. Um, and if you join, you get a discount. And um, with that, I think we want to say thank you very much for participating. It was great to have, I think at one point, we have 100 people and we had many more sign up who listened to it on the recording from all over the world, which was fantastic. Um, so please share this share, the, share this with your friend, um, friends and colleagues. And um, if you, yeah, please sign up for our next one on methane. And um, very, very nice to have you. And a huge thank you again to the Iowa team and also to our panelists today. Thanks everyone.